And now we come to lesson three, handgun safety. And when we break that down, lesson three is actually a lesson in four parts. The first part is the four cardinal rules. The second part is safe storage of your handgun. Third part is alcohol and firearms. And the fourth part is ammunition safety. So for clarity, uh, instead of just mashing it all together, I'm going to break the lesson down into those four separate parts. And part one, we should already have something on the whiteboard in relation to that, if I have followed the normal pattern. But let us proceed. Now I said in the introduction that this is a lesson in four parts. The first part is the four cardinal rules of handgun safety. Now we should have had a classroom discussion and you probably were able to come up with some pretty solid rules that are the same as these but maybe just worded differently. So here from the actual text, here's what it says in the book that the state provides. Four cardinal rules of safe gun handling. A. Treat all guns as loaded until you have personally inspected the weapon. B. Point the muzzle in a safe direction at all times. C. Keep your finger outside the trigger guard and on the frame until you are on target and have a legal right to fire and are going to fire. And D, be sure of your target and what's around and beyond it. Now there's a little demonstration I normally do in the classroom about how you can change what's beyond your target by taking a step to the right or a step to the left. That's something that's better done when I'm actually able to move around. The treating all guns is loaded by take on that or what was drilled into me as a young police officer was you always prove a weapon when you pick it up, take it from or hand it to another person. So whether you're getting it from somebody else, whether it's lying there and you don't know what condition it's in because you haven't had eyes on it for a long, long period of time or whether somebody's handing you the gun, and this used to happen in the gun store, people would hand me a gun and they thought it was unloaded, but they were wrong. So, you should always prove the condition of the weapon. Now, you may be proving that it is loaded. If it's your concealed carry gun, you might want to make sure there's a round in the chamber before you go out into the world. So basically, the A rule is, to put it another way, they say treat all guns as loaded. I say, be sure you know the condition of the weapon at the time that you receive it or give it to someone else. Point B. Point the muzzle in a safe direction at all times. It's not always clear where a safe direction is. Um, a sheetrock wall is not a safe direction if a person might be behind it. A ceiling, likewise, a window. Mostly the floor is going to be the safe direction for the purpose of picking up and proving a weapon. Floor typically is your best option unless you have somewhere uh, in the classroom I have designated uh, I'm not sure, yeah it should play out the safety table safety wall that's the designated safe direction in the classroom but just be mindful that if something bad happened uh, you want the gun pointed in the safest direction that you have open to you at the time there's always going to be the, the occasion where you have to compromise C. Keep your finger outside the trigger guard and on the frame until you are on target, have a legal right to fire and are going to fire. Well, if you go to the range, that's a no-brainer. You, you point the gun at the target, you're ready to shoot the paper target, then you can put your finger on the trigger and, and do your worst, that's fine. If you're going to shoot a human being, you want your finger to go on the trigger as the gun is coming up into the aim. And I'll, I'll talk about that in the classroom because that's a, that's a technique that ties in with principles of marksmanship. And D, the last one they talk about, 
is be sure of your target and what's around and beyond it. You may be going to shoot the crazy guy with a machete who's just about to kill his ex-wife who works at checkout at Walmart. But if you miss him and shoot little Wendy 30 yards behind him or 100 yards behind him, who just happens to be in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, you can go from hero to zero in a fraction of a second. So I think the point of that rule is just be mindful of what's behind what you're shooting at because you mightn't be the world's greatest shot and you may miss and your miss may have fairly serious consequences. So to finish the text from the book, these four basic rules should be applied to every aspect of gun handling. When storing a weapon, when handing the weapon to someone, or when loading or unloading, be sure of muzzle direction and trigger finger position. Handguns must be operational, and the operator must have an understanding of this operation. The handgun owner should read the owner's manual carefully in order to completely understand the operational characteristics of a specific make, model or type of handgun. Always, always think safety. The handgun can be used for self-protection. It should not be used for self-destruction. Uh, sadly, handguns are one of the most efficient means to self-destruct and uh, the statistics on that are often used by the gun grabbers to try and muddy the waters because they roll suicides in with handgun deaths to try and make it look like uh, we're living in the Wild West, which is another topic for discussion, but no matter. Right, the next portion of this is going to be stories of the handgun, so I'm going to assemble some of my props for that. Okay, students, listen up. <clears throat> the lesson continues. So, stories of the handgun, there's a bunch of different ways you can store your handgun and uh, we're going to go through what it says in the book. We can have a classroom discussion about this too, but we'll, we'll figure it out. Use of commercial trigger locks. Various commercial trigger locks are available that cover the trigger to prevent someone from using the weapon or firing it accidentally. We, we use these in... Uh, in the gun shop to stop people dry firing the 22 typically. So it means we're going to leave a 22 rifle or an air rifle out on the rack and it stops people pulling the trigger because on a rim fire the firing pin is a lot weaker than, than a center fire and they're easily broken if you dry fire them. These devices may not allow quick access to the weapon in a personal defense atmosphere. Yeah, that's true. Read the manufacturer's procedure for placing the trigger lock on the handgun. Most manufacturers of trigger locks require the weapon to be unloaded prior to placing the trigger lock on the handgun. It, it may be possible even with the trigger lock on the gun, if it's loaded, excuse me, you may still be able to, uh, to fire the trigger. Depends on the, on the design of the trigger lock. This is a fairly typical looking one here. This is uh, on one of my plastic classroom guns and the way this works you need the key and once it's on effectively you can't you can't really move the trigger but once it's on there to take it off you got to get the key in the right way up turn it comes apart and now your gun's operational so that's that's one kind of trigger lock Storage cases, hard and soft cases. Many different types of hard and soft cases are commercially available to store handguns. Many come with small locks to secure the weapon within the case, allowing the weapon to be stored loaded. For defensive purposes, this may be time consuming and is less than ideal for preventing theft. Yeah, here's a, here's a Smith & Wesson box. This is what my uh, little revolver came in, the uh, 442 model, 38 Special. You can maybe see here, uh, there's a hole there that the uh, padlock could go through, which would prevent you from opening the box. doesn't prevent you from sticking the box under your arm and running away with it, 
and then you can solve the lock at a later stage. But if you had children in the house, it might be a good way to stop the children from getting access to your gun. That's potentially a reasonable uh, way to use this. And as long as you keep the key where nobody else can get it, then you could take the padlock off, pop the case, and you could have your gun out of there in, in reasonably quick time. But these are all judgment calls, these are all personal preference issues. Padlocks and other locking devices. For storage and safety purposes, padlocks can be used to safely secure the weapon by locking a padlock around the top strap of a revolver. The cylinder cannot be closed. If the padlock is large enough, it can be placed behind the trigger and prohibit the rearward movement of the trigger. Some manufacturers make a cable and lock system that can be used on virtually any firearm. This is a revolver and this is just a regular combination padlock passed through the top strap. So because it's through the top strap, it's impossible to close the cylinder. If you can't close the cylinder, you can't shoot it. The gun's rendered useless. So again, if you had children in the house, this might be a good way to stop your children fooling around with your gun if you don't have a better way to store it, which we'll discuss some of those in a minute. Also talks about the cable type lock. The cable type lock, you get a semi-auto and you have the uh, slide lock to the rear. You pass the cable right down through the body of the gun through the magazine well. Now, if you wanted to have this gun available for personal defence, you'd have to get the padlock off it. And sometimes the hardest part in that is getting the key the right way up. You unlock that, and then if you had a magazine at the ready, magazine in, slide forward, boom, you're ready to shoot. So you could have the gun ready at fairly short notice, but you try putting a key in a lock and doing all that in a high stress situation when your home is being invaded. That's kind of tough, but that's a tactical thing that will talk about in the classroom. But we're working our way through what it says in the book, and that's one of the things it talks about. Breech locks. Commercial breech locks are now available for the different sizes of semi-automatic pistols. And by different sizes, I'm guessing they mean 9mm, 40 cal, 45, whatever. These locks are placed within the breech and then when the key is turned, extend into the chamber and cannot be removed. Well, that's just a more ingenious way to go about it. That would be, if you have your, uh, that's a drill round the way in case anybody's freaking out, so snap cap. So, if you had your semi-auto slide locked to the rear and you put one of these locks in here and you twist it, it, it just means for somebody to get it out of there without, without a key, they're going to have a hell of a job. They're, they're, they're trying to drill it out, take the gun apart, whatever. It's going to be a nightmare. So I've never seen one of these breech locks, but they would be a much uh, more secure way than a simple padlock that you could, you could couple a set of bolt cutters or a, uh, a hacksaw. So they do exist. I've never seen them, and they work in a big store. Gun safes and cabinets. Many types of safes and cabinets are available, including wall safes, picture safes, or large storage weapons cabinets and safes. Access is slow, as most are equipped with combination type locks. Some of these are ideal for preventing theft, but not for defensive purposes. And, and just on that, you can go to May Sports where I currently work, and uh, you can buy a safe about the same size as a refrigerator, larger or smaller, give or take, whatever. And uh, they are so heavy that your average thief is not going to have the wherewithal to try and take your safe away to try and open it. You know, if you have a big, solid, heavy safe, that's probably going to protect you from having any of your guns stolen. 
even if your house is broken into. It'll certainly keep the kids from getting at it, as long as they don't know the combination of the safe and stuff. It'll also stop you getting at them in a hurry, in a personal defence situation, although most of them have keypads and it's just beep, 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 beep. Doesn't take you more than uh, five or seven seconds to open one. Uh, one with a combination takes a little longer. And again, try try opening a combination lock in a high stress situation. Good luck with that, you know. So, I have a, a cheap sheet metal gun safe. It's not really a safe, it's really just a cabinet with a single lock. But that would be good enough if you just wanted to stop the children from getting to your getting to your guns and typically they have a, a, a pretty good key on them and if you keep that on your car keys, keep it where the kids can't get it then that would be a good way to secure your weapons from your children getting them uh, in an unauthorised way. And that is important because you have to remember the statute Storage of Firearms to Protect Minors, North Carolina General Statute 14-315.1 as was previously discussed in the section on the law. So. If your child or somebody else's child gets one of your guns and bad things happen, you're guilty of a criminal offence and you don't want that. So where to and where not to keep weapons in the home? When determining where to store a handgun in the home, consideration must be given to several factors. First, are there minors in the home? Or are there likely to be minors visiting the home? Considering uh, consideration of general statute blah blah may help in determining the type of access you will have to the firearm. Second, firearms, especially loaded ones, should be kept out of sight. If the handgun is not going to be used for personal protection, it should be secured, unloaded in a safe cabinet, cabinet or lockable box. Handguns should not be kept on bedside tables or on nightstands. As a general rule, the firearm should be approximately three steps from the bed. This ensures a conscious effort on the part of the occupant to obtain it. And this effort will allow the homeowner the opportunity to ensure that they are fully awake. Several serious injuries and fatalities have occurred from homeowners hearing a noise or seeing a shadow and shooting a firearm kept at bedside only to shoot themselves or a spouse. Handgun owners may consider storing the handgun with ammunition in a loading device nearby for use in personal defence. That actually uh, is probably a decent compromise if you have children in the house or if you're concerned about the gun maybe being used against you. If you have a, a loaded magazine and a semi-auto pistol in the same drawer, Boom. Takes me all of two seconds to put the mag in, make it ready for use. So, uh, and, and even if you have a situation where uh, you didn't have the slide open, you just had the gun with the slide back. So it's in the drawer, slide back, so the child's not going to get their fingers caught in it if they fool around with it. So then you pick it up, mag in. Crack a slide, boom, good to go. Doesn't take long. So that's not a bad system. Works with a semi-auto, doesn't work with a revolver. Revolver takes a little bit, a little bit longer to load it. So that basically is the section on handgun safety, how to secure it in your house. I, I like the concept of out of sight but close at hand. And I'm not going to give too much away about my home defence preparation, but let's just say there's hardly a room in the house where I couldn't put my hand on a gun within about three seconds. And uh, yes, I'm thinking perhaps somebody's going to try and home invade, going to try and take my collection. Uh, maybe somebody from the IRA has got a grudge, is going to track down some, some of his old enemies or whatever, who knows. But... Uh, I certainly embrace my right to uh, own and carry arms here and uh, you've got to have a plan, you got to say to yourself, right, I live in an apartment, I'm on the second floor, 
The only way to get into my apartment is through that one door on which I have a secondary lock. Where would I need my firearm to be if I was woke in the middle of the night with somebody trying to bust in? So you, you've got to think through some scenarios, you've got to think through if this happened, what could I do? How could I prevent myself from being a victim? And that's going to come down to your your personality, your thinking, what you perceive the threat to be, and various factors like that. So I'm going to tack in here the third portion, which is alcohol and firearms, because it's short and sweet and simple. If you go to a restaurant and you want to have a meal, you can have a glass of wine, you maybe have a beer, you might even have a little brandy. Uh, so long as you don't go over the legal limit for driving, you may drive your truck or car home with some alcohol in your system because the law allows you somewhere between here and here. The law permits a little bit of latitude that you can still operate a vehicle. The rule for your concealed carry handgun is zero. If you are carrying concealed, you may not have a single beer, a single glass of wine. North Carolina state law is zero, zero alcohol in your system if you're carrying concealed. That's the law. It helps to know it. And uh, if you fall foul of it, I told you, if you're concealed carrying, you're not allowed to drink at all. Plain and simple. This could be played in court at your trial. So don't say you weren't warned. Just on that, it doesn't mean that you can't go into a restaurant or a place where alcohol is being served and concealed carry, provided it's not posted saying that you can't. So you can go with your wife and kids, and grandkids, whatever. You can go to McDonald's, Bojangles, Ruby Tuesdays, whatever. You can have a nice tea and a big steak and whatever. And you can have your gun in your pocket. Somebody comes to rob the place, you pull out and shoot them dead. That's all hunky-dory. So long as you haven't been drinking. So that's the rules on alcohol. Nice and simple. So the next part is ammunition safety and that's kind of a two-parter in itself so uh, I'm going to use the whiteboard for that so we'll move on with that momentarily right this part of the lesson I'm going to talk about ammunition safety and I'll, I'll do a little bit of play acting here in a minute but basically there are two things that can go wrong when you're shooting. One is a misfire. Now a misfire is simply when you're shooting, gun goes bang, gun goes bang, gun goes click. So the gun goes click because the firing pin has fallen and the round has not detonated. So that's a misfire. The misfire could be the fault of the gun. It could be you have a worn firing pin, could be you have contamination in there that's uh, blocking the path of the firing pin. Uh, it could be a broken firing pin. So it might be the gun's fault, or it could be the fault of the ammunition. The ammunition may have a hard primer, and misfires are typically very common when you're shooting 22 or, or other rimfire ammo, but typically a 22 long rifle rim fire. That's where you typically get a misfire. Firing pin hits the rim of the case, the round does not go off. You put it in, try it again, still doesn't work, you throw it away, load another one. Happens all the time, it's common. And the good thing about a misfire is it's not dangerous. Typically it's not that dangerous. It's, it's just a minor inconvenience. Now, a squib on the other hand, and we had an example of this where the guy brought his gun into, into mace just the other day. You're shooting, your gun goes bang, your gun goes bang, your gun goes bang, your gun goes boo. And it makes a noise that is less than a proper report of the gun being fired. If you're shooting and you hear that happen, you should immediately stop everything. 
do not pull the trigger again. Normally a squib in a semi-automatic weapon will, will be accompanied with a fail to feed or a stoppage or, or for whatever reason. This, I had this happen to me actually with the Bolt Action 303 where I knew it was a squib and when I pulled back the bolt and the round came out of the chamber, powder spilled everywhere. So uh, the unburned powder came spilling out of the cartridge case. That would be another heads up that you'd, you'd had a squib. So the thing about a squib, it, it's not the gun's fault. It's the ammunition that's at fault. The powder or the primer or the combination of the two has got contaminated, damp, it's really old uh, for whatever reason. The difference between a squib and a misfire is a squib is very, very dangerous. So why is a squib very, very dangerous? Well, the example walked in to the shop yesterday and uh, this is where I'm going to do a little play acting. So this guy's on the range. It was actually a Glock 19 that he had bought and uh, excellent gun, super gun. He was shooting Winchester mass produced white box 9mm ammunition and he's on the range and he's going bang 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 and then it wouldn't feed another round and he couldn't understand why it wouldn't chamber. And he's not an experienced shooter, he's not that an experienced guy so he brought the gun into us and I said, I'm shooting my gun, it's not working. So we checked the barrel and there, lo and behold, about half an inch from the end of the breech is a 9mm bullet head stuck in the barrel. If he had succeeded in getting another round to chamber, it was actually just far enough in that he couldn't quite get around to see property. Lucky for him. Lucky for him it wasn't half an inch further in. Because if you have two bullets trying to go down the same barrel with one charge of powder, your gun is going to blow up in your face and that will be a bad day. So, you're shooting your gun, bang, bang, boom. Stop everything. Unload, rack the slide, check the barrel. Now with a handgun it's easy, it's only got a short barrel. You should be able to look down and if you can't see your fingernail, if it's black in there, you are done shooting that gun until it's checked over by a blacksmith. There, there are a couple of pro tips. You can drop a pen or a pencil or whatever you have at hand and see how far down the barrel it will go and then that will let you relate to exactly where it is in the chamber but basically if it's a handgun and this is a handgun course if it's a handgun you've had a squib the squib has stuck around in the barrel any attempt to force another bullet down the barrel will at least destroy your gun and potentially could kill you or blind you or maim you with shrapnel as the gun blows up in your hand so can't really emphasize enough this far no big whoop it's just an inconvenience. Squib load, if you try to shoot another round after it, could cause you serious injury. And that's all you need to know about that.